So we've been talking about knee replacements so far, and the next session is, is hips. And this talk is uh, on neither topic. This is about the future of orthopedics, and it's a general discussion about how technology is going to affect our profession in the next 10 or 20 years. And I'm going to outline uh, exponential technologies for a few minutes, and then I'll ask the panel about their opinions about how important each of these technologies are. Declarations of interest, which are not particularly relevant to this topic. So in the past, we've seen evolution of knee designs, like we've been hearing um, for the last uh, 24 hours. And currently, we have navigation systems like this one, which is an optical navigation system. And that's been used um, particularly in knees more and more. We also have these robotic systems, like the Striker haptic, uh, the, the Mako haptic field robotic arm. But these are complex systems. I put a, a um, can you run, let's see. I think it works, okay. So I put a GoPro in the corner of the operating room when they're setting up for a Mako case in my hospital and it's incredibly complicated. It took them 90 minutes to do this setup when normally they'd be able to set it up in half an hour. And the, you know, the robotic systems today, even though they are perhaps more accurate in some cases, they're very expensive and uh, time consuming. But this is just the present, it's not the future. So I'm going to outline, as I said, seven technologies and ask the panel what they think of each one. Before I do that, I want to explain something about mathematics, about exponential functions. You may have heard about uh, this analogy of the game of chess. I'm not sure, sure where chess was invented, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was in, in India. And the king, uh, said to the inventor of chess, well, I'll give you anything, it's such a great game. And, and the inventor of chess said to the king, just give me one grain, of, one grain of rice for the first square of the chessboard, two grains on the second square, four grains on the third square, and eight grains on the next square, and keep doubling the grains of rice. And of course, by the time you get to the 53rd square, you get uh, the entire world production of uh, wheat. Well, I said rice, but wheat today, that's 10 to the 16 grains. And by the time you get to the end of the 64 doublings, you have a huge amount of, uh, of wheat. But what people don't understand, or haven't thought about perhaps about exponential functions, is that the second half of the chessboard in this example has four billion times more wheat than the first half. And the last square has two billion times more wheat than the first square of the chessboard. So, if we, if you just bear with me for another minute on these exponential functions, this is an exponential, two exponential functions that I've plotted. The linear function there represents coal power and the exponential function rec re represents solar. And here we are today in the price performance of solar and coal. But when the exponential function crosses over, that's just the beginning because 10 years later, uh, the exponential function has left the linear function behind. And that's where we are with computers now. You may have heard of Moore's Law, where the number of transistors and resistors on a chip doubles every 24 months. And that's been the case for the last 100 years. And what that means is that the computer I have in my pocket now, which is an iPhone 10, which has 300 billion calculations per second, is the same computing power as the world's fastest supercomputer in 1994 when Bill Clinton was president. So in 20 years, the world's fastest computer gets into all of our pockets. And we're, we're vastly approaching the point where computers will be as fast and as capable as our own human brains. So there's already a supercomputer in America that has the same number of calculations per second as the human brain. And the, the iPhone that I have in my pocket is still um, about 10,000 times uh, slower than our brains, but um, you know, in 10 or 20 years we'll have our brain power in our hand. And so we've seen a rise of, um, we've seen a rise of, of machine competence that's overtaking human competencies. And I like to think of it in this way, this was by Hans Moravec, who, who has this metaphor of the landscape of human competence, where the elevation and the peaks of the Mountains represent a human competency, such as social interaction or management or chess or arithmetic or science. And the rising water 
represents the rising tide of machine competencies. So already machines can be better than humans at arithmetic, at memorization, at chess, at jeopardy. They're overtaking humans on vision and speech, driving. And so what happens in the next 10 or 20 years as the machines become more and more competent at all the things we do as humans and as surgeons and how's that going to affect our profession? And that's the question I have for the panel. So I'm going to, I'm going to outline these um, technologies and I'll, then I'll run down the panel and see what they think. And the first one is gene sequencing. So the genome was first sequenced in 2001 at a cost of $100 billion, sorry, $100 million, um, about the price of a, a jet. And now the gene, genome can be sequenced for the price of a bicycle for a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars. And uh, you can get your own gene sequenced for $99, not, not your whole genome, but a lot of genes sequenced in these uh, providers that tell you what diseases you might get and, and trace your family tree. So I think in orthopedics this is particularly important in uh, microbiology where there are, um, you know, they can be very specific um, identification of particular organisms and, um, and uh, so with, with, this, with these databases available of, of millions of uh, bacteria, they can be specifically identified to, to determine the, um, the sensitivities to um, antibiotics and that sort of thing. So maybe I'll ask the panel, can you think of any ways that gene sequencing is going to be important in orthopedics or is that something that's just going to be important in cancer and, and other areas where it you know, definitely is important? But is there anything in orthopedics where gene sequencing will help us? Anyone from the panel? Uh, yes, up this end. Uh, I just remember one book called Homo Deus, written by uh, Duval Harari. Yes. He has written a book called Homo Sapiens before, and he, yes. uh, you know, he analyzed how the human being evolved from uh, you know Neanderthals to current situation. And in this Homo Deus, he has mentioned what will happen to you in the next maybe a thousand years' time. And he has mentioned about what we all mentioned, that how we are increasing in technology and how machine intelligence is increasing. And according to him, that can go to a level where it's like we will be at a level to give similar comparison, maybe chimpanzees handling an iPhone 10X. Now, that technology, either we are not able to handle very well and will be surpassed by this machine intelligence and we will not be existing anymore. That's what he has mentioned. So, so that, that's a long-term thing, and it's an interesting book if you are interested. In I've, I've, read, yeah. I've read Homodeus and Sapiens. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And uh, so do you think that will happen? Do you think we will not exist anymore? Is no, we will exist in a very different way. We, it, it may not be a human body because what we call we is not my body. It's what is there in my mind and what I think about it. And that yes. could be put into a separate machine. And then okay. that machine will be me. So anyway, we are becoming a little hypothetical here. But regarding genome technology, definitely we can have some use in terms of we can develop some cartilage or we can prevent some diseases. Yes. Uh, it will have a definite uh, use in orthopedics, okay. uh, especially for a chronic condition like osteoarthritis. You can have something to, to tweak so that we do not get degeneration in the joint. Okay, thank you. And Someone then, else on the panel? Yes, I think coming uh, closer to our field, uh, they are identifying the genetic predisposition for osteoarthritis and what part of what gene uh, can lead to that. And the exciting part is that you can al alter that part of, of uh, you know, the telomere, the last part of the gene. Mm -hmm. So if you can do that, probably next few years, that could alter or change your predisposition to osteoarthrosis, I think. Okay, so we can detect who will get the disease and then use the CRISPR technology, the splicing technology to insert genes to prevent it. Thank you, yes? I think one of the things that we don't know is how to individualize for total hip replacement, what patients can tolerate. There are some patients that may be great for metal on metal, some patients may be great for ceramic on ceramic, ceramic on poly. I think looking at some of this technology to figure out what your predisposition is to say, you know what, you may be better for this bearing surface based on your biology. Because I think in total hip replacement, we see patients who have very little wear, but have massive osteolysis. And we have other patients who have a lot of wear, 
and no osteolysis. Mm -hmm. So clearly, I think there's a genetic predisposition for one or the other. So I think this may be help, helping us to figure out who's... So who's in, in other fields, they call that precision medicine, yeah. where you precisely get the genotype of a patient and target the treatment. It's important for cancer treatment and other treatments. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yes? Yeah, I think the, the best way I can think about machine learning uh, helping us is diagnosing a disease at much, much earlier and much finer mm -hmm. level. I think we know little about maybe RNA-related diag diagnostic markers. But say if there is an osteogenic sarcoma developing and it is of the size of a less than a centimeter, we don't have any imaging or any biochemical marker to find out. I think the best thing that can happen to us without any controversy from all this GPU and big data is diagnosing disease at much, much earlier level so that we can destroy. And that's going to be very beneficial for um, all of us who are treating the effects of the disease. As he said about arthritis or cartilage, mm -hmm. I think that's far-fetched. So early diagnosis of the disease through machine learning, artificial intelligence. Thank you. Yes, let's move down. I think uh, the immediate um, help from this uh, is in seronegative infections, or, or, sorry, in yeah. culture negative infections, mm -hmm. which we are already making a lot of progress. Now we, uh, you know, not just waiting for culture, we are sending them for molecular uh, biology and trying to find out which bug is it. So okay. I think that is the immediate uh, what is available. Yeah. But in the future, probably like, um, you know, predicting the progression of osteoarthritis or preventing predictive, uh, you know, treatment and also outcome. So probably it is going to help in the future. So, okay, yeah. thank you very much. Um, large work is going on on rheumatology, the transmission of uh, heredity, transmission of rheumatoid, it's a major impact. And uh, I think something will come up uh, with gene uh, alteration and gene therapy to avoid this transmission. A lot of osteoarthritis is also heredity transmitted, so there is a significant work going on and I think something will come out definitely. So for inflammatory arthritis? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. And the next one I have here is mixed realities. So I don't know if any of the panel have experienced this, but there's a, a technology available now called the HoloLens and you put this lens on and it can project a hologram onto the environment. So you could, you could um, can take your three-dimensional modeling from the CT scan and you can project it into the patient. So mm. when you're doing your surgery, you can actually see the pelvis inside the patient. Um, so do you think that could have applications for, for surgery? Maybe we'll start up the other end and come back this time. Uh, yeah, I think these technologies uh, are really uh, booming up in... Um, uh, uh, some part of the world like uh, Tel Aviv, where even the OT screens have uh, LED screens and whatever you see is projected on the screen. So it really gives you four-dimensional uh, outlook for preparation and uh, dimensions. So technology is really coming up to tell us, guide us the inside and 3D, 4D picture. If it, if it can become dynamic uh, than yes. static, then okay. it will be a revolution uh, okay. in, in orthopedic surgeries. So if it so could become dynamic, yes? Yeah. yeah. I think uh, data acquisition and analysis and interpretation is the way to go. If I am, say, resecting a tumor with all its margin, and if hologram shows me that I am a little short of it, I think that will benefit patients in a big way. But the downside is medical legal. And downside is, are the interpretations, what is happening on table, going to be in an open domain or closed door? If it is in an open domain, we have all sorts of authorities at our necks. And there is a medical legality that I can predict. So I think it is good and bad. It's double-edged weapon. Mm. And as Hawkins put it, it will either destroy humanity or it will benefit humanity. Depends on how we use and analyze it. That's one of the important questions, is all the data that's being generated, 
uh, who has access to the data and who controls and owns the data because that's ultimately um, where the power is, 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 is in, the, in the data. Yes. Yeah. So I look at this technology as very similar to what we do for maybe some of our residents and people that we're training for the next generation. Mm -hmm. And we have the ability to do simulation in the lab to say, hey, you know what? This is how you do a total knee replacement, total hip replacement, arthroscopy, whatever it is. I think you look at this technology and you say, this is the data that I'm getting. How do I use this to benefit patients? So I think this kind of technology is going to be helpful as long as you know what you're looking at. Sure, okay. If you know like what you're actually going to look at and say, this is going to make my decision to be X versus something else. So. Okay. Any, anything to add? Yeah, so this is an interesting part of surgical planning now is the CAD CAM design. So you take your CT scan and with the help of CAD CAM modeling, you can see everything and uh, even help perform surgery. Uh, but the important thing is uh, that all, with all these models, uh, you need to be careful that you, uh, you're not going overboard and you're not creating complications. So that learning curve will always be there. So it could be a delivery tool for planning. Yes. Yeah, HoloLens could be good for uh, training a surgeon because uh, it, it's a static thing. Unless it becomes dynamic, like I've got a complex fracture of, say, uh, upper end of femur, and the uh, leg position changes, whatever data recorded in my hologram will not be the same matching with this. So I may not be able to, you know, cut where I expect it to be there. It could have changed when I'm doing the surgery. So that's so, the registration yeah. of the 3D model to the physical patient is critical. That it, that the model is projected accurately on the patient. Yes, that's an important technical challenge. Okay, so virtual reality, we've sort of mentioned this. You talked about uh, training of residents. This is what you were talking about, mm -hmm. I think. So this is, that was mixed reality. This is virtual reality where, the ho where you can't see any of your natural environment. You pro projected just this virtual environment and there are training modules where you can teach how to do a hip replacement or a knee replacement. Um, we. I got one of these from the university and I brought it into my department and put it in, the, in there and invited all the junior residents to come and use it and they just uh, ignored it. Nobody was interested. So <laughs> does anyone else have any experience with, with this virtual reality training or comments? No? Yes? It doesn't give you that feel. I've tried it. But it doesn't give you that feel that a cadaver gives you. That's so right. I think yes. So there's no haptic feel. There is no haptic feel of how yeah. much force you need to put on the reamer or how much force you need to put yes. on insert the cup. So there are some, you know, companies trying to develop the haptic haptic feedback, but that's probably what it needs to make it valuable. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you know, image recognition. The phone that I have in my pocket can recognise my face. It's not difficult to understand how that could be applied to an X-ray. So do you think um, image recognition? either two-dimensional or three-dimensional could be applied to our pre-operative um, x-rays or our post-operative x-rays to analyze uh, problems, to analyze diagnosis and help. Do you think that could be useful? I have seen this thing being used in one of the IITs in uh, India, IIT Bombay. The team had come to us and they're trying to get the 3D image purely from the AP and lateral x-rays and that if they can do it very well, and they were trying to validate the thing. I don't know what happened to the project. But then it will reduce significant amount of exposure of radiation in taking a CT scan for a patient. You just take two pictures, AP lateral. And based on that, you can get a significant amount of 3D modeling. And then it will be much easier that way. It can be done. I don't know how much level of accuracy they have got with this. OK. Yes, comment down here. I, yeah, this is, this is already there. I mean, uh, say, for example, conformist knee. Is, is a type of 3D modeling for that particular patient with customized instruments and that just one knee for that patient. This is already there even in pelvic acetabular surgery or tumor surgery, which is very interesting. So this 3D uh, imaging and CAD com CAM modeling, I think is already there with us right now. It's going to improve. Yes. I think it's, it, it's not just the complex situations we are looking at. This um, image recognition, artificial intelligence, is going to revolutionize the way we are going to diagnose. From simple fracture, missed fracture, to uh, you know, uh, assessing the uh, damage in osteoarthritic knee or a hip, 
or the uh, whatever defect, bone defect and planning, it's, it is going to revolutionize in the near future. Okay. Yeah, I think as Anup said, the modeling of bone is already in place. What, what is going to help us more is understanding 3D biomechanics. Mm -hmm. Because we really don't know what is the balance level in a best performing knee in terms of the ligament, muscles, the gait training and all that stuff. So I think there is an area that we need to, that will probably help more is uh, soft tissue, what happens after a good balanced knee. I'm glad you said that because that's my next slide, kinematic modeling. So understanding the 3D balance. So you take the three dimensional model and then you maybe add some uh, simulation or maybe even some measurement of the patient. So you might uh, measure the patient in the gait lab with their arthritis, you might do some measurements with a KT-1000 or other stress measurements, and you actually combine that with a 3D model and get a full kinematic model of the patient, and maybe that would help you to plan your surgery better or to, or to diagnose problems when you have an, a knee replacement in a patient that's unhappy. Uh, what about additive manufacturing? We're already seeing additive manufacturing to create um, you know, acetabular components for patient-specific implants, We've got patient-specific instruments. Um, this is just one technology in the lab that I work at where there's a bone substitute that can be 3D printed. So can we, do you think there's a future for additive manufacturing to develop uh, more and more sophisticated three-dimensional substitutes for human tissue or replacements? Is there a place for that? I think certainly. The 3D printing is already making inroads into orthopedic surgeons' life. So, and in, in the rest of the world, uh, these things are quite uh, advanced. As in, in healthcare, the use of uh, deep learning and uh, these technologies, we are a little bit slow. But I think we can't escape. Yes. Uh, but probably what will restrict is uh, using pure artificial intelligence without uh, human interference probably is uh, very, going to be very difficult. Extended intelligence is uh, what is right for uh, our uh, healthcare, especially for orthopedic surgeons. Okay. Yeah, uh, 3D printing models are extremely useful in uh, both revision scenario, TKR, THR, and you have custom-made uh, uh, implants also, focus like acetabular, uh, you have three flange acetabular, so it really helps and it adds to your technology and surgical skill. It helps us. It's very useful. Okay. Um, this is a nanosurface technology that's being developed in Sydney based on the dragonfly wing with these nano spikes that uh, make it difficult for bacteria to live on the surface. So what about nanotechnologies? Is, there, is that going to be important? Yeah, nano, I think uh, we are almost there in terms of silver-coated implants where the biofilm, because of the surfactant, factor brought very low, there is a whole lot of area of research that is coming up. How mm -hmm. far we can coat a, a particular implant or titanium or a special titanium or a special ceramic or a special HA, which can be much faster, quicker, and antibacterial thing is a, is a thing to observe. I think this yes. will go great. I think if there is one technology which is going to make a lot of difference in orthopedic surgeon's life, it is nanotechnology from uh, joint replacements to spine surgeries to you know sports medicine uh, to everything the, uh, and infections treating infections nanotechnology is going to be quite revolutionary yes uh, there are a lot of uh, hip implants have been tried where you can identify the bugs and they are coated with antibiotics so even the biological film is formed the organism can be attacked from the implant surface and biological film will not uh, destroy. Uh, it can be effective with the antibiotic coating on the implants. Even there are some uh, uh, technology where you can identify the bugs from outside with this uh, coating, special coating. So a lot of research work is going on. And Another comment? Yes. Yeah, I think the uh, principle needs to be outlined. So if this is a glass full of candies, this is a particular surface area. So as soon as you fill it with nanophase particles, the surface area increased by 1,000-fold. So it's the increase in surface area by nanotechnology or nanophase that will help us in orthopedics. So especially in arthroplasty, I think it's nanophase HA coating on implants 
which is closer to the surface size of bone. That will increase bony in growth and prevent fibrous in growth that is currently happening with some HA coats because the particle size is larger. Similarly for infection or nano phase silver dressings are already there which, okay. which increase the surface area of, the, uh, of that particular um, silver or gold or whatever selenium sometimes. Okay, thank you. And the last one I have is artificial intelligence. And these are three designs on the screen. The one on the left was created by a human. The one in the middle was a, the human design was given to a machine and the machine refined it uh, with artificial intelligence. And the one on the right is when the machine was just given uh, no design to start with, but just given the parameters they had to design. It comes up with something completely different that a human could never think of. And just to show how easy this is, this is my son. And uh, he was learning on his computer machine learning and I brought some x-rays home for him and he loaded them into the computer and he was able to create the app. Uh, with so, just um, so you got, free you got software. This. Wait. This. Wait, so you go to the app and it has this, you press the photo button, comes up the photo, you take a picture of total hit and then you go use photo and then it says this is a total hip. Can you focus? There we go. So See? <laughs> yeah. So my son was able to do that with 20 x-rays of a total hip and 20 x-rays of a hip resurfacing to create an app that could tell the difference between a hip resurfacing and a total hip. So it's already better than a medical student. <laughs> Just with a 12-year-old boy and 20 x-rays. Thank you. And it's actually not that hard to do uh, with tools that are available on the internet. And that's, that's the x-rays that he used to create that app. But to get more detailed information, you need more data and, and more data. And eventually, it's the data that, that actually is important for this artificial intelligence and machine learning. And if we can add imaging data with intraoperative information, with outcomes data, with survival data, then we can create these machine learning algorithms that I think, as some of the panel have said, are going to be very, very um, powerful. So can I just have one last comment from each of the panel members? Um, back to the algorithm of Hans Moravec's landscape of human competencies. In 20 years' time, uh, what will the, the role of the surgeon be and what will be taken over by machines? Will the surgeons exist at all? Will we have some function, no function? Can you tell us what you think? I think I will take it a little further. What we talk about human being is my mind, my brain. It's not my hand, it's not my leg. People without hand, without leg can still do everything. So eventually, uh, trying to recreate my knee or recreate my hip is not essential. It's more, what is important is, can I preserve my brain? I live today for 80 years or 90 years. Can I make it to live for 50, 200 years or 1,000 years? So eventually, we are talking about a biological body which is not going to be permanent. Okay. What we need to talk about the intelligence, about brain or feeling or, and so eventually we'll be replaced. That's what I feel. Yeah, only I next maybe 200 years, we are trying to develop these things to continue the human body to behave the way it is. Now some of the best thinkers on these technologies have said and written that they'll only help clinicians and surgeons to become better. Not only in surgical part, but in the way we plan, the way we do our surgery, the way our hospitals are run, the way our hospital finances are controlled by big data. So I think it's going, it's very exciting. It's, it's an adjuvant to us and, and not something competitive. Okay, complimentary. I mean, the reality is I'm gonna probably come to Sydney to have your son do my total hip replacement. <laughs> um, I think it's a matter of how we look at some of the data that we're getting to be better. And so at some point, we may be obsolete but you still have to look at the data, what we're getting in to say, am I going to use this data to make it a better surgery for the, for the patient I'm taking care of? Okay, so someone still has to over, oversee yeah. it and make the decisions. Yeah, next. I'll quote Hawkins for what he said about AI and uh, artificial intelligence is it can destroy humanity or it can take it to other level. I would only predict and wish that AI brings in technology to the common man, to, a, to the common orthopedic surgeon, cheaper. The, the technology that we have today is much expensive. 
And you can imagine what a web-based call today is costing nothing, whereas 10 years back it would cost a bomb to call United States for 10 minutes. So I think the cost is the main issue, and I don't think any biomechanical skill can be learned faster. There is a finite time human brain has to work on it. There is no doubt that uh, deep learning and biomimicry is going to rule orthopedic surgeon's life and uh, have impact on the patient's and outcomes and uh, decision making. But at the end, if you look at the space technology or the aircraft technology, uh, when human beings are involved, although the artificial intelligence can drive a plane or take a ship, but uh, the, there will be human um, intervention, uh, human presence required yeah. if something goes wrong. Uh, human oversight. Yeah. If something happens so, outside yeah. the outside the boundaries yeah, outside the, the boundaries yeah. which uh, machine i don't know how predict, it will yeah. be able to deal with but that is why the latest thing is not artificial intelligence alone it is the extended intelligence with the human brain uh, i think it's uh, artificial intelligence is just a tool you should know how to use it and enjoy it thank you very much well, i think it's coffee break so um, we'll see you back here in 20 minutes yes thank you uh, thank you, Dr. Walter. That was a very nice session. I think today Amar gave you only 20 minutes, but probably 10 years from now we'll have a whole day talking about this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Walter, and thank the panel.